Good evening, friends. This is Holly Teitzma, and this is a evocative but not definitive review of John 12, verses 20 through 50. Let's begin by looking at this as the thought unit that Patrick told us about last week. It is a large unit, 1155 through 1250, and it functions as a hinge between the first part of the Gospel of John and the second half of the Gospel of John and the particular verses you see there. It comes to us in two sections, and it covers two days of the Passover. Now, it's kind of bizarre to our modern ears, but the first part of the section is actually an introduction to the second half of the Gospel, and the second half of the section is a conclusion to the first half of the gospel. And this is called a chain link. It was a method for writing histories in kind of a narrative form that kept the reader moving forward um, in kind of a forward and back, forward and back way. Let's begin with verse 20. In verse 20, we are seeing a response to the verse that came before, where the Jewish leaders are expressing concern and consternation that the world has gone after Jesus. And in fact, in verse 20 through 23, we see Andrew and Philip, they have Greek names, bringing Greeks to Jesus. So immediately after this fear is, is professed, Greeks in the world are brought or are going after Jesus. And they seek to see Jesus, and Jesus does respond to them with a lot of words, even though it doesn't seem to be much of a dialogue here. But Jesus takes this as the sign that it is time for him to die. It is time for him to be glorified. The time has come for the human one to be glorified. And then we get the, all the verses about uh, a grain of wheat falling and hating this life. It's a very rich passage here, and I encourage you to, to delve deep into it. After the signs, uh, or I'm sorry, after the words, he does respond with a very brief deed, and that deed is simply, after Jesus said these things, he went away and hid from them. Then we have the conclusion to the signs ministry. There may have been a larger section here, um, would explain some of the textual very oddities, but this is what we have, and it is it, it is the end of Jesus's public ministry, and it begins by recognizing, in some ways, the failure of that uh, ministry, and attempts to explain the unbelief that we see everywhere. Um, they don't believe the signs. They don't even believe the voice from heaven. There is unbelief. Uh, regardless of all the things that uh, are shown to people. And the first way that John shows us uh, or gives us a reason for this is that unbelief actually fulfills prophecy. And the prophecy of Isaiah 53.1 and 6.10 are what he presents in this section. And then he gives or takes from that that there is actually a divine reason then for the unbelief, that there's something sovereign or God's sovereignty is, is somehow involved here, and I will go into that deep, more deeply later. And the second reason in 42 and 43 is the human reason, uh, that even though uh, there is this gift of salvation in this, through the, we can see in the signs in, in Jesus' ministry, uh, humans still, as it says, they loved human praise more than God's glory. So our response, our human response, is to reject the ministry. And finally, we have the conclusion to the sayings ministry. And here we have a tight little A, B, B, A pattern. The first A in verses 44 and 45 uh, is showing the functional oneness of Jesus and the Father that Jesus is God's agent. Jesus shouted. So note here that Jesus is, this is his last attempt to uh, convey the importance of his message. And so he shouts, whoever believes in me doesn't believe in me, but in the one who sent me. Whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. So again, 
the functional oneness between seeing Jesus and seeing God. Jesus then goes on to, in 46 and 47 with the, his intent and the intent as its purpose. And he says here, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me won't live in darkness. If people hear my words and don't keep them, I don't judge them. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. Right? So the, orig the intent, the purpose is to save the world not to judge it. However, there is a result of the words of coming into the world. And in fact, even coming into the world is, an, is a type of judgment because we didn't believe. We needed this revelation, the revelation of Jesus. But that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to save. And judgment is the result. Whoever rejects me and doesn't receive my words will be judged on the last day by the words I have spoken by the words, not by Jesus, All right? So that's important to understand that judgment is a result of rejecting the word. And finally, we close with a prime, closing again with a functional oneness between Jesus and the Father. His final words in his ministry, I don't speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me regarding what I should say and speak I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, whatever I say is just as the Father has said to me. If we see Jesus, we see God. Jesus is one with the Father in that he obeys what he, the Father tells him. And what the Father tells him is eternal life. So when we believe in Jesus, we receive eternal life. Uh, let's go through a couple of text issues. The first one is that um, we see again this phrase, lifted up. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He says this back in his response to the Greeks. When we've heard this in, at other times, let me go ahead and go to those times. He's very vague. So we're not sure if the lifted up is a physical lifting up, such as on a cross or on a stick, like with Moses and the snake, or an exalting, lifted up as in being exalted. And in the two passages before, 314 and 828, it's unclear. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up. We see the Greek term, the same uh, root word is being used the same in both cases. However, in verse 23, John now says something that the Johannian uh, community already knows. He says in this gospel that he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the lifted up that Jesus is speaking of is, being, is to be crucified. It is the physical lifting up, but there's something else going on. And we see this in how the, and it's kind of brought out in how the crowd responds to him. First, the crowd responds, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the human one must be lifted up? Who is this human one? Now, it's already been established that Jesus is the human one. Um, so what's really being focused on here is this some discrepancy that they they think that there is between who the Christ is and, and the duration of the life and reign of the Messiah and what Jesus is saying right now Jesus the one that they assume is the human one that he is going to be lifted up and, and, and therefore crucified died now Smith points out some confusion here because in the intertestinal writings we see lots of variations in how they understand the life and reign uh, duration of the Messiah. Um, Psalms of Solomon, one Enoch, uh, some of them have the eternal, that there is a living forever. Uh, but there are others that say he, the Messiah will die and rise again. And Smith claims that it really was not all that common of a Judean belief at the time for there to be a Christ that remains forever. So we have to wonder what's really going on here in the text. 
what it seems like then is that John is trying to highlight the paradox through the discrepancy between what they think is going to happen and what Jesus is saying here. All right? Now, they're focused on the law, which could be the eternal father mentioned in the Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. But really, it's the paradox that when Jesus is lifted up, something that is supposed to be shameful to Jesus, we actually witness the physical lifting up as our own shame for putting an innocent man to death in all the different ways that we do this. And through that, through him obeying the Father perfectly obediently for our sakes, he therefore is exalted. And there's the paradox. Let's look at a few things overlaps with the Synoptic Gospels. The first one is in verse 25. Those who love me, those who love their lives will lose them, and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. We see this very similarly in Mark 8, 835. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. We see it in Matthew 16, 25, Luke 9, 24. And then we also see it again in Matthew 10.39 and Luke 17.33. And these are from the Q source. So here we have three different sources coming together and saying very similar words. So we have to, well, probably should interpret this as being pretty darn important uh, through to the message of, of Jesus, that those who love their lives will lose them and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. The next one is that there is a great deal, there is some odd but uh, um, real uh, overlap between uh, John's narrative of uh, the agony uh, at 12, 27 through 36. And it's very similar to the ones, uh, even though it's also very different, the ones in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In all of them, we see that Jesus is, is troubled, that he's having this uh, inner dialogue, this kind of debate with himself. What should I say? Father, save me from this time. No, for this reason I have come to this time. Father, glorify your name. So there's higher good wins out. Um, he doesn't love this life, but, uh, but loves something bigger. We also see this uh, carried out in Hebrews 5, 7 through 10. I'm not going to read it to you, so, but please do go look at it and see how similar it is to, to these narratives, even though the narratives are different. All the themes uh, are carried through. And finally, in terms of the overlap with the synoptics, um, the Isaiah 53 and 6 passages that we see in 38 and 40 of John 12 are used in very similar ways in the synoptics, in Acts, and the epistles. Uh, the Isaiah passages show why people don't believe or understand the parables or why they don't believe the signs. Let's look at a few themes from John, the bigger gospel. Um, one thing is clear that humans have a really hard time understanding um, revelation within the historical moment itself. Uh, we, we can see the thunder or hear the noise of God or voice of God and call it thunder. Uh, Jesus can be praying out loud directly to the Father. The Father responds from heaven and people still think it's an angel that's responding. Um, it is really, we have an, it's ambiguous and I think this is Talbert. Uh, we don't interpret this well. We don't apprehend uh, these events very well. Um, it's our own obtuseness, though. And Jesus tries over and over again to give us these signs, to give us these words, and yet we refuse. But the next part that John is trying to show throughout the gospel, we see here too, is he uses from Isaiah that it is a fulfillment of prophecy. This was predicted. Um, Jesus knew that this was going to be the case. He made their eyes blind, says Isaiah, and closed their minds so that they may not see with their eyes or understand with their minds. John is 
not saying here, or Isaiah is not saying here, that God struck us blind or them blind, but they were given over to blindness because we're the ones that even though it is universally available, even though God um, invites everyone, we refuse to see in our own human desire for the praise of humans as opposed to God's glory. It is a fulfillment of prophecy. So there is a divine element. And to make that point even uh, deeper, John also wants us to know, uh, and he says this, we also see it in other parts, that Jesus is God's glory. Isaiah said these things because he saw Jesus' glory. He spoke about Jesus. John is claiming here that in the theophany, in the throne, in the vision of the throne room that Isaiah has in fifty uh, or in six ten, uh, that he sees Jesus. That the glory that he sees is the pre-existent Christ. Right? How can he say this? How can he say that Jesus is God's glory? Well, let's look at a couple things here. In Isaiah forty verse five. It says, the Lord's glory will appear. Okay, so there's the prediction that the glory will be shown. And all humanity will see it together. The Lord's mouth has commanded it. Um, Arise, shine, your light has come. The Lord's glory has shown upon you. I assume the Messiah. So we can anticipate that the glory is coming, that God's glory will shine, and John is making the equate, uh, is equating this to Jesus, that Jesus is that glory. However, in the same, with the same um, texts, Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I don't hand out my glory to others or my praise to idols. In 48, 11, for the sake of my reputation, for my own sake, I will act. For why will my name be made impure? I won't give my glory to another. So how can John claim that Isaiah is seeing the pre-existent Christ, is seeing God's uh, Jesus when he sees God's glory in the throne room? The reason is, is that John is claiming oneness. And it is that Jesus is precisely God's glory. And this is what Smith articulates. Um, so if you want to read it, go to Smith. Um, so Smith is saying that God's glory is revealed through Jesus because Jesus and the Father are one. John is claiming that Isaiah has not seen the Father, that's important, but the preexistent Christ. And John is using um, scripture here as a proof text. He really kind of knows his stuff. And then we see it in the closing summary um, of Jesus' teaching. We really get the flavor of the oneness. Again, whoever believes in me doesn't believe in me, but in the one who sent me. So there we have the solidification of the oneness. And so therefore, uh, Isaiah can claim that, or John can claim that Isaiah saw the glory of God, um, in, in, it saw Jesus in God's glory. Um way over. Key motives, uh, motive, motifs, um, we've already been over this. I'll just let you kind of soak those in. You don't really need me to read those for you, but I hope that's something that you got. Uh, one thing that I didn't highlight is that when we serve, when we follow Jesus, who is the human one, the Father's agent, it bears fruit, yes, but in serving, it also brings us honor. My Father will honor whoever serves me. And the honor may not feel like honor to us. Um, the honor um, may come in forms that we wouldn't consider as praiseworthy or um, nice trappings of a human life, but they come in the spiritual form. So applications here uh, that follow that. I work with a lot of clients who, um, they're in my office because they keep seeking happiness. And it's not that they can't see happy, find happiness and that's why they're in my office. They're in my office because they're seeking something that doesn't really ever bring what you try to make it bring. Um, and so they're in my office a lot of times for 
reasons equated with uh, moral therapeutic deism uh, that they want in life. So I would say that maybe countering that by really digging into verse 25 and exploring what it means to hate this life and um, seek instead the glory of the Father. Um, I think that would be helpful. Another theme, again, is that universality of the invitation, that the invitation is available to everyone. It's available to everyone. It is when in our rejecting of it, when we don't take it, that judgment is the result. Not the purpose, but the result. So those would be some themes that I would recommend uh, you consider preaching on. I hope this has made some sense. I apologize for the length, um, but let's close this up and get it uploaded.